Hey everyone, it's 5.56 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, <clears throat> 5.20, uh, 2019. Sure. Uh, this, oh, before I start, I, I want to pre-apologize because there's, I'm probably going to be, just prob like in the last video, doing a lot of sniffling. It's, it's the prednisone. They've had me on prednisone most of the chemo, and when you're on it, your nose just runs like a faucet. Nothing I can do about it, sorry. Uh, but I, I did want to say that this this video is uh, I, not planned, not really. Prompted a little bit uh, by comments from the last one. And I'm, I'm going to hit those, and I hope I can hit them quickly and move on to a couple of other things. Um, because there's been a number of books that I've been reading in the course of research that I've been doing in the uh, uh, Mormonism, Judaism thing, it, it, there's been tons of books that I've been having to uh, mostly collect digitally and read at least portions of. The one that has held my attention the most, even though there were only little points that I was just picking up from it um, and by memory. Um, but just because of, of how perceptive it is and the fact that when one goes searching for books on this subject, <clears throat> one of the unfortunate things is you're going to run <coughs> inevitably because of who owns the publishers and distribution and who has control of uh, a lot of information that you're going to be able to get on the internet. Most of the books on most subjects are very philo-Jewish. They're, they're, they're more in their favor, just, just like the works of Flavius Josephus. Okay, you, you, could, you could put him right in there with the Manasseh ben Israels and the Gersom Sholems, and, and he would be completely at home, or that literature. Forget he. I don't even know if that guy existed, as it's said he existed. Um, the, the main person who even has quoted as him uh, being extant when it's said he was is Eusebius. And anybody who paid any attention, not only to Fomenko, but other alternative historians in their criticisms of Eusebius, would know that his existence is highly questionable as well. He's linked to Constantine, whose existence is highly questionable as well. Unless you're okay with the popular historical narrative. And the popular historical narrative is going to be gotten to um, not from the point of view of somebody like a Fomenko or an Illig, uh, or, or any other uh, alternative historian, or if you want to call him a revisionist or a restitutionist historian, but from what I've been picking up as I've been going along. So the first thing I want to address is a little bit about, and I don't have a, uh, I don't have a bird's eye view uh, photo available. I'm going to, I may be reading just the smallest amount of description from the works of Flavius Josephus concerning Masada, but there's a couple of things I want to mention about it. Now, when I commented on it, Masada was actually an afterthought um, concerning the fact that there was only that singular eyewitness about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, by whom, when, um, Masada was an afterthought, because Masada was essentially supposed to be the last couple years um, of what they call the first Jewish revolt. And the reason I even brought that in is because from, you know, day one of the revolt and the um, putting in place of a siege, as the story goes, and this is only from Josephus, 
who, by the way, was not an eyewitness. I said there was one eyewitness. He wasn't an eyewitness to anything that supposedly happened uh, at this place called Masada. So I don't know how he's even reliable there. You go to the Jewish Virtual Library and look up Josephus. They themselves keep him at an arm's distance. Um, and, and that <laughs> alone is very telling. Um, so anyways, I put that in there just to illustrate how strange it was that it's said that this first Jew and Jewish rebellion was started in the year 66 and that it went over the course of about six years. Now some would say seven because they would say 66 to 73, but it was part of the way into 66 and into 73. 70, 1, 2, 3. Anyways, it would have equaled out to about 6 point, probably 6.6 6 years. <laughs> Just like there's currently 6.6 6 million Jews estimated to be living in the realm of Palestine. So the couple of things I wanted to point out. Now there's a description in the Wars of the Jews, right, uh, by this character uh, called Flavius Josephus, in which he describes a place that does sound quite like um, what currently stands uh, in the Negev to the west of the Dead Sea. Um, and now keep in mind, in the Bible there is a body of water whose description cannot be harmonized with the Dead Sea. It's called Yamala. There is also an area north of there that's referred to a few times called Yam Kanrath. Something people have to keep in mind. And this is the strange part because if you don't pay close attention you'll just figure these places for being, say, like the Sea of Galilee um, and the Dead Sea. You'll figure uh, the Yardan described in the Bible as the Jordan of today if you don't pay attention to the descriptions. But I'm not going to get off on that rabbit trail. So yeah, there are there are descriptions from this character named Flavius Josephus that bear a similarity to the Masada that, that is standing today. There's some strange things though. There's, there's some holes that are in his description and there are problems at the site today. I'm scrolling through this real quick. I'm at point five, and it's going to be in just about the last chapter, chapter eight, in <clears throat> what is called Wars of the Jews. Um, so he describes this place, and, and it does sound much like where all the tourists go, this place called Masada. He says that it was built by Herod. He's, he is the source for everything you'll, you will hear if you went on a tour, let's say, to that site. It's going to come from Josephus. Again, not even an eyewitness to these things. But anyways, um, by that time, he would have been living uh, far, far away from there. Um, so, he says that it was built by Herod the Great for either reason of revolt of the Jews against him or uh, the other reason he gives is Cleopatra. <laughs> uh 
as a worry of his. That um, Mark Anthony would, would allow her to uh, take over uh, that realm of his because I know that uh, the Negev Desert was prime real estate for sure. So it's said that he had a palace on the west side that there were all kinds of storage houses towards the north and if you look at what's called Masada uh, from overhead it's uh, almost sort of a diamond shape so what they say would have been the storehouses would have been towards the north there wasn't really much of anything towards the south and it's claimed by Josephus that he had walls built all around the top because it's a it's a plateau that he had walls built all around the top that were somewhere in the neighborhood of about uh, I want to say he claimed that the the walls themselves <clears throat> were somewhere in the area of 40 let's see and get to the de the, the descriptive parts not not that I want to cuz I remember most of this and and you know if you really want to check it out for yourself I, I just I don't care cuz I don't want to spend too much time on this but I'd rather be accused of being uh wrong for any number of reasons that don't have anything to do with Masada okay this is this is where I want to get to the walls that they say that uh, Herod already had on the top of this plateau. And its circumference is, is very, uh, it's big. So, first off, it says that he had a wall, let's see, upon, uh, upon this top of the hill, Jonathan the high priest, first of all, built a fortress and called it Masada, after which the rebuilding of this place employed the care of King Herod to a great degree. He also built the wall round about the entire top of the hill, seven furlongs long, the entire top of the hill. It was composed of white stone. I'm going to have to check that as far as what they claim the, the top was there. Anyway, it was composed of white stone. And I've, I've watched these tours and seen them up there. Um, I don't recall any white stone. Its height was 12 because all of that, they, they claim that all of that, that's remnants, that's ruins of this original place. W what is currently up there? Okay, so I'm looking for these things. Everything they claim was there. I'm, I'm looking for its remnants, its traces. Now it says the height of this was 12 cubits. And its breadth, 8 cubits. So if we're going by the cubits, as they say, they say the cubit could have been anywhere from 12 to 18 inches. So anywhere, anywhere from a foot to a foot and a half. So this wall he had to build was at least 12 to 18 feet high and at least 8 to 12 feet wide of this white stone. But where is it? I don't even see, I haven't seen yet or heard them talk about the footer for this wall which would have been very very heavy and you would need a good sturdy footer for this whole wall in fact we're going to talk more about footers too and anyways he said that um, uh, there were also erected upon that wall 38 towers 38 towers each of them 50 cubits high so anywhere from 50 to 75 feet high out of which you might pass into lesser edifices which were built on the inside round about the entire wall for the king reserved the top of the hill which was of a fat soil a better mound than any valley for agriculture that's what they say that he had all of this rich soil there and that's how they they could plant and they could grow things there um, because they say that there were all of these cisterns up there on and in the palace. And I don't know how many of those really survived. Because in everything I looked for, in article form, in video form, 
concerning cisterns and their existence. Anything they have up there that they show on tours, cistern-wise, are all dry as a bone. All of them. Now, they'll say, well, they were plastered so that the, at the time, they were plastered so that the water wouldn't seep into the, the rock. Where'd the plaster go? These, what they show are, are bone-dry, bare stone chambers. There's nothing to them. Um, again, but that's, anybody could claim, well, water does go in them, but, you know, then it seeps into the rock. Well, I looked into the average rainfall of the Negev Desert, and it's very, very low, even in winter. I know there are flash floods because the channeling of the type of mountain terrain that is in the Negev Desert is going to cause things like that to happen. But there are more problems with that, by the way. So, he described something that was built up very, very big. And it would have to leave remnants behind. Unless somebody came there and tore all of it out and away, these remnants would still be there, like gigantic footers for these towers. Um, and, and huge footers for these walls. And then it's said that the commander that came and laid siege to the place built a wall around this entire plateau. Now, in the description of what they say Herod built to fill the secret huge cisterns that they always show off that have no plastering whatsoever and always bone dry, now, this would be the reason why. They would say, well, he figured out this ingenious way to divert all of these, these huge water flows that they would get in winter. Sometimes, if they get a really rainy winter, and I don't know how close to this plateau these water flows get, but they say that he devised all kinds of ingenious channels that would go to a type of dam wall, <laughs> not with an N at the end, dam wall, a dam wall that would have to uh, then feed into an aqueduct. Now this aqueduct would have to be very, very long because the way that um, Masada rises up from the desert, not only on the east, but on the west side of it, your aqueduct is going to have to start from a long ways away to empty into whatever all of these great hidden cisterns are. Because once you get to a certain level down, there, there is no place for cisterns. It's, it's either chasms or, or just a slope off from uh, this plateau. They'd have to rise a certain amount, so they're going to have to be long. And long aqueducts are going to call for um, very large uh, columns and very big footers, which I would imagine, unless the Roman army or some other army or people had broken up these footers and carried them off years ago for who knows what reason, they should still be there. I don't see any of those things. There's no evidence of any of these things. There is simply um, s just certain edifices that, that stand at the current Masada, which I don't think much of when I look at them. I, I, I think that some crews could have put all of that together in a, a relatively short amount of time. Same thing with, with what they call Hezekiah's Tunnel, which I don't think matches up to what is described in the Bible as what King Hezekiah did when he brought the Gehun down uh, on the western side of Jerusalem. That, th th there's only, in the whole Bible, one Gehun described, and it's one of the uh, Nair that comes out of the Garden of Eden, Ganaden. So I, I just wanted to address quickly on that because I didn't see any way they were really going to be getting any fresh water. And, I, you know, okay, this was the other thing. 
And I mentioned this in some of the comments when I was going back and forth talking with uh, Mark. You'll see them if you check the comments of the last video. The flash floods in the Negev produce basically not water, but a slurry of filth. And that's what would have collected eventually if really there was this sort of uh, channels to a dam to what would have to be a very long aqueduct because water has to flow downhill. And you'll know what I mean if you go and you look at pictures of Masada. Um, <laughs> and then they say, of course, that the Romans had to get everything, you know, um, transported to them from a, a large distance because of where Masada is towards the southern part of the Dead Sea, which at that time, this is what, and what Josephus refers to as Lake Asphaltitis. Asphaltitis. Um, interesting, too, because they claim that there are often asphalt floats found uh, on the Dead Sea here, there, and wherever, but you can't find, and nobody's ever reported, um, any of the slime pits that are described in, say, Genesis chapter 14 ever at all. But, okay. Um, so the Romans, they say, had to get all of their food, water, and everything else brought from this long distance. If what this character Josephus describes in the Wars of the Jews, chapter 8, were correct. Then this Herod the Great, which, by the way, would have been dead when Jesus um, was a little child. And then he had um, ancestors that ruled after him. So he was a tetrarch, he was a puppet. And I'm I'm giving you by the way, this is not my opinion, this is just the um this is the accepted narrative. Puppet of Rome. Rome would have known about his palace and all his reserves that he had. Out in Masada, were they in fact there? He was their puppet there would have been whomever was over him and in charge of him at some point in all those years inspecting the place. Why? For the benefit of Rome is why. They're not going to let him have uh, something that is, is entirely beneficial to himself. And if the place was as well stocked and everything as well preserved as is claimed by this character, Flavius Josephus. I would think, with all of the claimed necessary travel of Roman soldiers towards the south, wherever they were going, that they would have designated that as an oasis, would have commandeered it from a very early time and I have a real hard time believing that any of these insurgents ever would have went and taken the place. I would have thought that it would have been as soon as it was found out that Herod the Great had this whole place set up, it would have been occupied by Roman soldiers from that time forward. Because if soldiers have to move from place to place to place, and they oftentimes have to do it over land, on foot, there has to be a number of oases, if that's in fact how you say it, for them. And, boy, that sounds to me like a very, that would have been a very good oasis, eh? Um, there are so many other things about that place that just strike me as Stupid. Not that... 
I mean, would it be a good holdout? You know, I guess. I guess. Um, you'd be stuck there, though. Um, you would be stuck there. So I don't know. I don't know what I think of the whole thing, the whole debacle. It's got one witness. Like I said, it's this character called Flavius Josephus. I stopped reading, and this is why I had to, to double check, and I didn't even remember any of this material. Because when I first read Josephus through, it was years ago. And the thing I noticed, and I mistakenly sort of um, brushed off at the time, was how even his narrative in narratives in antiquities of the Jews couldn't follow the Bible. The guy could not, for the life of him, follow the Bible. He would give a wink and a nod to the biblical narrative, and then would go off on his own course constantly. That was the whole character of this entire work. And if you ask me, the whole entire work of Antiquities of the Jews sounds more Talmudic and rabbinic than anything else. And that, with that, I will cut off that part of the narrative. And I would like to move very quickly then to this idea of the Talmud and how the ideas of the Jews do not have anything to do with the Torah. And the Torah is really just a pretext for them to claim that they serve the same God, Aliyim, as the Christian does, or the true Israelite does, when in fact they don't. They simply, to, in or, to be repetitive, it is only a pretext. And if you spend any time, and this is something I remarked on in the last Occasional Offerings video from yesterday or the day before, yesterday, I, well, I don't know. A anyways, um, all of those, let's say those juicy parts of the Talmud, like that uh, Jan Irving and Lloyd de Jong, really liked to focus on in the in what parts of that series I could even stomach. Um, and I told you, I think I did. It, it, all you have to do, first off, is you can go to authors of about a century or more ago, which you can find plenty of, and they will fill in many of those blanks, first off. Um, and if everybody's fine with going to what they call church fathers, apostolic fathers, and so on and so forth, to fill in parts of the Bible, or to, um, to at least verify that those ideas are running parallel, um, I don't see what a problem you have with going and finding numerous authors that are commenting on the Talmud that fill in those blanks that you guys say don't exist in current copies of the Talmud. Yeah, the Sonsino is not going to have those certain things, but they will often have gaps. There will be obvious gaps at those places where you can tell they've been redacted. Why? And, and there are letters and there are orders given out to to Jews that if they want to know what those certain parts that are redacted in most of the Talmuds they have mean to go to their rabbis because they're going to explain it to them. They're going to let them know all of those things that guys like Lloyd de Jong and Jan Irving claim the Talmud doesn't say. However, as I said, you can just start reading at the beginning of the Talmud. And you can see how they will take 
any and every possible passage from what they call Torah uh, and the prophets, the writings in general that we would call the Old Testament, and they twist and pervert them. And you wonder, how is that? That is just, how can they do that to the entire Bible? I'm going to try to answer that question in a few kind of big strokes here. And I, I'm hoping that what's going to happen is I can finish this off with a, a chunk of reading from Alfred Rosenberg um, to solidify a bit of what I've been pondering and pontificating on for quite some time now. Um, but this is going to start in 2 Kings 17.1, and I am reading from the World English Bible. It is the uh, one of the simplest to read and to hear uh, that I have on hand. Okay, this is going to relate to the people type that is called Sephardic Jews. <clears throat> A couple of things uh, maybe I could go over about historical Sephardic Jews as they stand today, or as it stands today. And one thing is that they are definitely, um, by just about anybody who would comment on the subject, considered um, more ancient than what are called Ashkenazic Jews. Now, the, the thing is, the Ashkenazi are far more visible, and now in many realms of politics and um, merchandising and uh, money, they're far more visible and uh, far more plentiful. The funny thing is, now there was a guy who some time ago, not quite a century ago, had written a book on the Sephardics that had first popularized and colonized uh, in the Americas. And he wrote about them like they were royalty. And these days, people who would consider themselves pure Sephardics. Um, and the reason for that is what I believe happened was that a, whole, a, a large number of Sephardics at a point in history mingled their seed with a great many of the people that we consider Ashkenazics. And the reason is that they are, to a certain degree, um, very similar. Many of them uh, who, who still claim to be Sephardics and who still claim to be Ashkenazics are very similar genetically. And it's no surprise because the Sephardics had no problem with mixing their seed with everything and anything that crossed their path. Which is why we get so many mamzers in so many places that they first have colonized and set up all of their merchant bases at. So before going on too long with that, so then you got these Sephardics. Now, one thing that I've found in a lot of the literature that I've had to read is many authors both Jewish and some non-Jewish, or at least a non-Jewish pen name, I don't know, have approached the subject of uh, who the Sephardics are and where their name comes from. And a lot of them will say, well, their name comes from Spain. The name of Spain, where they were mostly from uh, for the longest time, you know, until uh, they were dispersed or something. Um, that story for me doesn't wash. I think there's a far, far, far older explanation for where the name Sephardic comes from. And we can find it in the Bible. Second Kings 17.24 The king of Asher, or Assyria, brought men from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, from Hamath, and Sepharvaim. That's the way it's translated into English. And you'll find that narrative about the king of Asher bringing in these people in about four or five different places. Now, if I switch over to, let's just go to the straight 
block style Masoretic Hebrew here. We'll go to the same same verse and we'll see that it is Separ U Im. Separuim, which if you put the P into a PH, or like translating a pi to a phi, sephar, and then you really just have the U, which they can, sometimes they'll translate to a V, sometimes to other vowels, sepharuim, sephard, sephardics. They come from that, and nobody knows at the time that the king of Asher had started taking over the various um, inheritances or territories of various tribes, and they weren't all northern, as it's, it's typically said. I mean, you did have three um, that were... Uh, east of, of the Yarden that were taken by another king of Asher. This happened over kind of a decent period of time. And then once Asher had uh, full control of all of these territories, except for a portion of Judah, because they carried away a number of the cities of Judah as well. Um, and then it was all stopped in Jerusalem during the time of King Hezekiah. But anyways, and, you know, and then after that, um, they had kept that territory peopled with all of these various people, including these Sepharvames, for a couple few centuries. And all of these people had a tendency to mingle together, as did all of the various Canaanite tribes that were already there uh, when Israel came in and were told to expel them in many cases they weren't always told to kill them there were just there were certain people with their animals because of unnatural practices oftentimes murderous depraved practices of these peoples and their beasts they were told to wipe them out Oftentimes they didn't even do that, but put, put most people to tribute. A number of the people they were told to just drive out, they didn't even do that. But all of these people had a tendency to easily mingle with one another. Now, a quick portion of, of this from Second Kings, starting in 1724. I told you, the king of Assyria, he brought in men from uh, Babylon, Kutha, and I am just reading the, uh, the translated names. The, uh, the actual Obri names are quite different when you pronounce them in a more pure linguistic style. Uh, and from Hamath and from Sepharvaim, place them in the cities of Samaria or Shomron instead of the children of Israel. And they possessed Shomron or Samaria and lived in its cities. And oftentimes you'll find that Samaria is a representation of a very large area. Uh, of land um, uh, because it was the chief city of all of the so-called northern tribes. It's oftentimes going to be used as a representation of many of the lands that those tribes once lived in. So onward, uh, so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they did not fear Yahweh. Therefore, Yahweh sent lions among them, which killed some of them. Um, not sure if that's lions or another large land mammal. I still haven't worked that out yet. Um, but it, whether it's lions or bears, um, large animals that are coming in and killing these people. Therefore, they spoke to the king of Assyria or Asher, saying, The nations which you have carried away and placed in the cities of Shomron don't know the law of the God of the land. Therefore he has sent lions among them, and behold, they kill them, because they don't know the law of the God of the land. Then the king of Asher commanded, saying, Carry there one of the priests whom you brought from there, 
and let them go and dwell there, and let them teach them the law of the God of the land. So one of the priests whom they carried away from Shomron, or Samaria, came and lived in Bethel and taught them how they should fear Yahweh. However, every nation made gods of their own. They put them in their houses of the high places which the Samaritans, or Shomroni, had made, every nation in their cities in which they lived. The men of Babylon made Sukkot Benot. See, they never, they never transliterate any of this stuff. They simply transcribe it phonetically from Masoretic Hebrew. So you don't know what in the heck this stuff is. You don't know if this is basically houses of underage female prostitution or exactly what it is. And the men of Kuth made Nergal. The men of Hamath made Ashima. Uh, the Avites made uh, Nibhaz and Tartak, as if any of this is enlightening any of you, right? But here, and the Sepharvites, the Sepharvites burn their children in the fire of Adramalek and Anamalek, the gods of the Sepharvim. So they feared Yahweh and also made from among themselves priests of the high places for themselves who sacrificed for them in the houses of the high places. They feared Yahweh and also served their own gods after the ways of the nations from among whom they had been carried away. To this day, they do as they did before. It's exactly what they did. So, <clears throat> the chronicler of Second Kings here is telling you that well, they brought a priest from the north who could have taught them the law, but the practices in the, the Israel uh, tribes of the north was always commented on throughout First Kings and Second Kings up to this point as following after the sins of Jeroboam. So there was still... Um, there was still a problem with their practice. Though they may well have had a good deal of the Law and Prophets, which they could have taught them, which was obviously enough to where uh, he probably stopped sending these large land animals uh, into all of their settlements to kill them. But they hung on to all of their pagan practices and their pagan gods as well. Now, what I'm here to tell you is that's exactly the kind of mentality and practice I see reflected in the Talmud. Now, I'm going to go here next to, uh, not Nehemiah, but how about Ezra 4.1. So by the time Ezra and these, this remnant, remnant of Judah, Benjamin, and Levi, you have to remember, many, many, many years before this, the great extent of who was Israel, including many of the people of Judah, many of the people of Benjamin, and Levites, were all taken away. They were taken away. And even though um, many of the mainstream historians would say that they were carried to a place that is between the current Tigris and Euphrates rivers. That doesn't wash, since the Euphrates could not possibly be the same as the Parat. And it's not, I used to call it Parath. I have a, an issue with that, which I have changed actually, in everything that I've, I've produced and published on the um, obreproject.info uh, documents. <clears throat> um, what is commonly called the Tav, I believe, did have a hard sound instead of the, the softer TH sound. And what is commonly called the Tet is the one I believe had the softer TH sound. And that is comparing it to, first off, the Greek, especially Koine, because I see the same fingerprints on Koine Greek that I see on Masoretic Hebrew. So I am keeping it that way for now, and it makes the most sense alphabetically too. So that river 
which I would have formerly called Parath, I would call Prat. It can't possibly ever match with today's Euphrates, ever, ever. So where all of them went, even from those cities which they say that, that they were carried to on uh, the Guzan, um, who knows from there. Now, Ezra and the remnant that came back, very small amount, very, very small amount. There were so many more of all of the tribes of Israel that were dispersed and that continued to be dispersed for many, 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 many long years. Only a small remnant returned with Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, Ezra himself records that they were by a river uh, in a place called, and if you pronounce it purely, without the Masoretic Nakud, a place or a river called Iowa. When they come back from there, uh, starting in Ezra 4.1, it records this. It says, Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity were building a temple to Yahweh, the Aliyim of Yisrael, they came near to Zerubbabel, who was the governor, made governor of the whole project and the people, and he was actually a descendant of the kings of Judah, uh, and to the heads of the father's households, and said to them, quote, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do. And we've been sacrificing to him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, or Asher, who brought us up here. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the heads of the father's households of Israel said to him, You have nothing to do with us in building the house of our Aliyim, but we ourselves together will build to Yahweh the Aliyim of Yisrael, as King Karush or Cyrus, the king of Persia, or Paras, Paris, has commanded us. Then the people of the land weaken the hands of the people of Judah and troubling them in building. And you can see a much broader description of this also in the book of Nehemiah. The problems there. These people, who would later become known by, I guess, most people in general as Samaritans, Shomroni, were a conglomeration of all of these different peoples. One of them being, what, the Sepharvim. Now, the interesting thing is, as I was going through this, I was seeing what was available in Nehemiah. And I'm just going to, I'm going to hit you with this real fast, because it's something that I've mentioned in the past, and it's something that needs to be thought about. <clears throat> in Nehemiah, around chapter 8, Ezra, the same Ezra the scribe, that, whose book we just read from, is going to read the law to the people. Now, Earlier than this, you can read in Nehemiah where they start building the wall. And uh, different peoples and their different families started building on different parts of the wall. because they started with the wall. And uh, certain people and families would work on the gates because the gates were the, their own project, right? And he mentions things like the fish gate, for one thing, which is weird, and I've mentioned that before, um, if the modern-day Jerusalem was in fact the Jerusalem that we're looking at from the Bible, how far would they have to come with the fish? From where? And would it not spoil? Why would they have a specific fish gate at this city? Now, the one thing that it gets even weirder is that we'll see in verse 3, uh, it says that he read it, the law, to the people. He read it from before the wide place that was in front of the water gate from early morning until midday. And I can click on Nehemiah 3 and I can go to the block style Hebrew and I can see that it is meme, which they would usually say is my M. It'd be more meme because it'd be M Y M which the Y usually has a hearty sound, meme, shore, and shore is always gate. It is the water gate. 
No doubt about it. It's the water gate. The water gate of Jerusalem, which they say is the modern day place they tell us is Jerusalem. Now, if you go to a basic dictionary, this is probably like uh, an online dictionary, and you can just put in Watergate, you're going to get about a billion uh, descriptions of Nixon and the Watergate scandal. But uh, you can also find that it was always known as the gate of a town or castle opening onto a lake, river, or sea, or a sluice or floodgate. What need at all does modern day Jerusalem have for a water gate and a fish gate? So that was just that was just a quick aside thing. But hopefully that at least tells you what my opinion is, what my answer is when people say something like, "Well, where did the name Sephardic come from, the Sephardic Jews?" There. Not from Spain. I maybe somewhere along the the way, Spain um, got its name from the high concentration of Sephardim that lived there? I don't even know if that's true, because nobody can prove that. Just like genealogies to the tribe of Judah or any tribe of Israel, they can't prove those either from the Sephardim or, again, the Ashkenazis. Ashkenazi, why do they call them Ashkenazi? And I had to look into that too. Well, they say they call them Ashkenazis because the greatest majority of them, um, they say, fanned out at a certain point from living in Germany because uh, tons of them over time had migrated to Germany because the getting was good amongst my uh, Saxon and Bavarian and Prussian people. And so, you know, wherever the getting's good, that's where they go. Because the typical pattern is that greedy, uh, greedy lords and aristocrats and kings and nobles and such will import these Jews so that they can um, burden the people with usurious loans, uh, pawnbroking, what they call sharp practices, um, basically every type of extortion. Uh, possible. And then what they do is they secretly would pay up uh, a good deal of that to the kings, lords, nobles, aristocrats, and all of that. And it, it caught up with them. And I believe that you can read in Revelation. Um, hopefully I can hit that without hitting pause. I did. Uh, go to Revelation. I'll go back to the World English Bible. And it should be in two. And we can also see this in Daniel, uh, not only Daniel, well, no, Daniel chapter 2, with the, uh, the feet of iron and clay. And I'm pretty sure what we want to do is have, we want to see Thyatira. Yeah, you read on the church of Thyatira, and I think that's a, that's a great explanation there of these, these kings, nobles, lords, aristocrats of the people. Uh, of Europe who were importing uh, these people to simply shake down their people because they weren't allowed to. They weren't allowed to. Christian law and biblical law ruled in these countries. They were not allowed to affect usury on their people. Not openly. Not until guys like John Calvin or John Cohen snuck all of that into acceptable Protestantism. Um, so yeah, read, read on Thyatira and just see what you think. I mean, you know, part of the passage I can say, uh, in Thyatira it says you, you, you tolerate that woman Jezebel so in Revelation 2.20. I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. She teaches and seduces my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. 
Now, a lot of you remember Jezebel was uh, the daughter of, I believe it was the king of um, what they would call Tyr mm, or Sidon. They were somewhat close places. Anyways, she was not purely an Israelite. She was foreign, or at least mixed. And the uh, Israelite king Ahab married her. She surrounded herself by, by priests of Baal, or Baal, as they call it in Masoretic. It goes on in Revelation 2.21, I gave her time to repent, but she, she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. What is that? Her idolatry? Behold, I will throw her into a bed, and those who commit adultery with her into great oppression, unless they repent of their works. I'll kill her children with death, and all the assemblies will know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. But I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, as many as don't have this teaching, who don't know what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say I'm not putting any other burden on you the deep things of Satan. And I'll tell you something, the Talmud and the Zohar are deep. And these, these insane laws, what they call laws these days, which are Talmudic because they're nothing but pure sophistry, uh, legislated to oppress the people, are the deep things of Satan. They all have the same vein to them. Um, so these Ashkenazics around in the 1800s they heavily fanned out from Germany many of them coming to America now they say here's what they say this is a story that we get they say that they called themselves Ashkenazics because they came from the land and area or territory of Germany, and they say that the Germanic peoples are the Ashkenazics of old, which Ashkenaz was a descendant of Japheth. Again, they can't prove that. That is the claim. There are many claims being made by Jewish peoples in their literature that they can't prove are true, one way or another. My counterclaim is, I believe that they are most likely specifically the Ashkenazics. They are from Ashkenaz, the descendant of Japheth, and they are specifically who is being referred to in Gog from the land of Magog. Now, Gog wasn't necessarily a people. Gog is a high position. Um, it's like saying the top to say Gog of the land of Magog. And you, you follow that down, being the chief prince of Meshach, and Tabal, and where Meshek and Tabal most likely are, and who they most likely are, and you'll see that uh, the Ashkenazics um, are more likely named because that's who they are than the fact that they came from Germany and they claim that the German people are Ashkenaz. So here's something that I think is going to be entirely instructive. On many of the um, thoughts I've had in the past. I said that because of the disconnect between history that we see in the Bible and history as we've been told it has developed and today's current atmosphere of who's who, I've always said, well, there would have to be a people who had a sophisticated worldwide network and were in the right places, the right offices, um, to change history as we know it. Um, and it might have taken a long period of time to do it, but that's what it would have to be. It would have to essentially be a people of one mind who conspired together to affect something like that. They could change our perception today of history, geography, um, science, uh, religion, all kinds of things. If they had a sophisticated network of communication and were in the right places to 
to change a lot of things. So I'm going to read up from a portion of the book written uh, back in, I think he wrote this in the 30s, if not the late 20s, um, Alfred Rosenberg, who, as I've, I've mentioned, he was a journalist. He became... Uh, he became very high up in the NSDAP, or National Socialist Party of Germany. Um, he was very well educated. Uh, the, the chief difference I have, or point of contention I have with him, is he equates Talmudism with the Old Testament. And I find that to be... In my estimation, people who do that, and there are many people to this day who continue to do that, that that is a deliberate error. It's not, some, it's not an error you need to make if you just take time to read what's going on in the Old Testament and then read what's going on in the Talmud. You will see the huge, gigantic disconnect between the two. So anyone who equates the two, I believe they're oftentimes doing it deliberately um, because I think because they really want to reject the Old Testament. It's so strange to me, those people who will reject the Old Testament because of Jews and Jewry, but embrace the New Testament um, because of the fruit they see of, of Christianity. Um, and what's so odd to me is that we're talking about the same God through the whole thing. You can't get around that. Now, I know it looks like a different God, and there looks like different situations, different times. There is a serious, sharp problem with continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. There truly is, but I think that comes far more from manipulation. Again, manipulation of the same people who manipulate the text of the Old Testament in order to produce the Talmud. But I'll stop there. So here, uh, and you can get this from archive.org. It, it's called um, um, the, the Track of the Jew Through the Ages by Alfred Rosenberg. And, and here we're, we're in a section, and uh, it's on page 88 of the book, uh, Jewry and Politics, Historical Overview. And he says, uh, and, and keep in mind, this guy was a very good writer. Um, oftentimes in German writing, um, the, <laughs> from this time too, because we have gotten kind of dumber in the last century. Um, oftentimes their sentences were commonly compound one after the other. And we are talking about something that was originally written in German and then translated into English. And depending on the translator, um, some things flow very, very smoothly, and some things not so. But I will do my best to bring it to you, okay? So here he goes. One of the many lies of our times that is eagerly spread by Jews and defenders of Jews consists in the opinion that only in the present time can the Jewish nation act politically, and that only in the present time are they taken into consideration. The falsehood that, again, like many others in the past, it aims at cultivating compassion for the, quote, innocently persecuted and, quote, oppressed people of Jewry must finally stop conducting its mischief. For though the Jews were also spread throughout the world, and it is to be noted through their own impulse, they maintained a very close community not only where they lived together abroad, but also stood in constant connection with their fellow tribesmen in the most distant lands. Merchant ships and caravans brought news of all sorts from all the places of the world and conducted back such. In this way were the Jews informed not only of the events in their own community and nation, but no less of the commercial and political conditions of all countries which ensured them an advantage over other peoples in every relationship. We have got correspondences which offer convincing evidence for the constant international connection of the Jews. 
Thus, there lived in Barcelona in the 13th century one of the best-known Talmudists of his time, Solomon ben Adarith. His name was spread through distant lands by Jewish travelers, and the rabbis of their communities directed questions of all kinds to the wise man in Spain. His responses, altogether 6,000 in number, you like that, 6,000? show that he was in immediate written correspondence with the Jews in Portugal, France, Bohemia, Germany, indeed stood in connection even with Constantinople and the cities of Asia and North Africa, quote, glancing through these responses, one cannot avoid astonishment, says a Jewish historian, at the remarkable means of communication which were at the command of the Jews in spite of all obstacles. For a scholar in Austerlitz, or, um, I'm sorry, Austerlitz, or in German um, Mühlhausen, it seems not to have been less easy to have his letters sent to Spain than for one in Vienna, Rome, or Avignon. A further proof of the well-organized news network of the Jews is given in the following incident. On the African coast, there was always pockets of countless Turkish pirates. Here the Jews nested by preference. They were treated well by the Turks since they paid them a toll, bought the stolen goods immediately, and expedited them, mainly, however, for their espionage service. Uh, they maintained, says a writer of that time, which would be the 17th century, quote, a widespread correspondence throughout Christendom so that the Turks enjoyed through them a great gain in the trading of slaves. At the same time, they could be altered in time regarding what was being planned to be undertaken in Christendom. Thus it happened that in 1662, the city of Hamburg equipped two warships to protect their ships from pirates. The ships were not yet fully at sea, when slaves from Algeria wrote that the pirates knew all the circumstances. How strong, how many people on the fleet, and what course the ship's course would take. That the Jews were best oriented on foreign relations and possessed good connections in all countries is also not an achievement of our time, but was already the case for centuries. So it's also understandable that European princes often sought Jews as political advisors. Charlemagne, for example, gave his envoys to Persia, both of whom strangely died during the journey, a Jew as an escort in the correct calculation that the latter could best and most quickly learn from the Jews there all that was worth knowing. The Spanish kings were constantly surrounded by Jewish advisors, and not less the princes of Fez and Tripoli, the sultan, and other rulers. Thus these people scattered through the world, and yet indissolubly connected, played a perceivable role in the politics of nations already in the earliest times. They may unquestionably have rendered services to many princes, but it is not less certain that they more often brought great calamity on them. Here a fundamental observation is in order. The Jews, no matter into what kingdom they may have entered, came as a self-enclosed people that nowhere and never showed the least desire to get more closely involved with the native people than was absolutely necessary for trading. Now remember, Rosenberg starts out in the 13th, or 13th century, that's 1200s. He's talking about their sophisticated network they had at that time. From the start, and I'm telling you, and I didn't read from it this time, the prophets, I will at some point in some video, show you the clear worldwide network that these people called Canaanites, or like later on, called Samaritans, which included the mixing of these people called Sepharvaim, had worldwide networks of, 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 of merchants merchandising from far, far, far before, many, 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 
many centuries before the advent of him called Christ. So Rosenberg goes on, he says, from the start, on account of a natural and highly developed arrogance, they looked upon all people as inferior, and it was out of the question that a Jew would merge with the host providing him hospitality. And then it is natural, leaving aside moral evaluation, that he, where he was called to, or was able to creep into, eminent positions dealt in such a way as seemed best to his personal and national requirements. The interests of the country could coincide with those of the Jews. In that case, they were supported. If not, they were abandoned. Anyone who has an idea of how tenaciously the Jews held together in religion and politics in spite of all these self-induced persecutions, how they, moving from country to country, became only more rigid and hard, will not find it hard to understand that these people, apart from very few exceptions, naturally were not able to conceive of the idea of state citizenship and, in general, to raise themselves to the disinterested concept of duty. Even in earlier ages, Jewish policy was one limited to a few nations and not yet one encompassing the whole world. And if it may not have been conducted so deliberately as today, the national factor always stood along with the purely personal in the foreground. At first, this activity was directed mostly against the people hosting them, and as mentioned, only where the interests of the Jews were promoted, as well as were services rendered to the country in question, from <clears throat> oh, Johann uh, Chrysostomus, already found himself compelled to raise his voice, quote, these traitors, these worst of villains, betray our fatherland, our strength, to the Turks, and we tolerate them, we feed them. That is to stir up the damage to our hearts, to warm the serpent at our breast. Now, Rosenberg goes on and, uh, for another couple of pages concerning the deep, um, very sophisticated, worldwide network that could be illustrated from the earliest times he could reach back that they had. Again, as I said, from at least like the 1200s. They had a sophisticated, very quick, very secretive worldwide network. So when you consider the changes to history, geography, philosophy, the way that Christianity has been perverted, um, ideas that, that, that say things like across the board, well, the, the Masoretic rabbis standardized the text and gave us these nakud, these vowel points, out of the goodness of their hearts to enlighten us as opposed to hide the original language and confuse us. Ideas that say something like, well, we all know, everybody who's educated, anyone who knows anything just knows that the New Testament was originally written in Greek, right, dummy? You see, if you control the information and you are devious and you know how to use uh, psychological, sociological tactics against the people and you want to entirely change their ideas about things and you have a worldwide network you have the power and the ability to do these things. And there are names that, that I haven't even brought up. We're talking about old world names. The kind of names that, um, that disinfo agents will bring up as old world European names. You know, when they like to bring up uh, the big ones would be like Medici, uh, Farnese and all that. That kind of old world names. Um, these are the kind of people I'm talking about because 
uh, as you look at them closer and closer and closer, what you're going to see is more characteristics from those people that should strike you as being old world Canaanite, Sepharvaim, um, Samaritan merchants. From We're talking about Old Testament times that have survived down through the ages. <clears throat> So I highly recommend uh, anybody who can grab that book. It's on archive.org. Uh, it's not a long book. I would already be through it if I wasn't having to read a number of things all at once. Um, and keep something else in mind. This is a question that has uh, started to invade my thoughts a lot. And because I'm still trudging through the, the end of of the book War Cycles, Peace, Peace Cycles by Richard Kelly Hoskins. And the region, reason I say trudging is because it, for any of you that get a hold of this book or read it, uh, and I hope you can because I've tried to get a hold of Mr. Hops, Hopkins recently to see if his books were still available because I was going to put a link on my website so people could go to his Virginia Publishing Company, which I don't. the website doesn't come up anymore. He never returned my last email. I mean, he's 90-something years old now, if he's still alive, and I hope he is, but, I mean, he's he's getting up there. And the correspondences I had with him months ago, they kind of showed his age. Uh, and I don't, I'm not saying that in, assault, in an in insulting or demeaning way. 90-something years old. Come on, I'm 44, and uh, I'm telling you, sometimes I just don't have it together mentally. Um, Anyways, so the last little bit of that book, War Cycles, Peace Cycles, is it's redundant just because he has to go over he has to go over different situations that are happening in different places. Um, but the thing is, the patterns are still the same. So it gets to the point to where it feels very redundant because you have to look at new information with similar patterns and it's hard to sometimes put everything together. That's the only reason I say that, okay? But um, the thing that really strikes me is this. In reading through War Cycles, Peace Cycles, and he talks a lot about banking. And he talks a ton about banking in this and, and how usury banking or interest banking uh, affects the people how bad it is for people. Now, if you go back far enough, and, and, and it's still this, the case today, by the way, folks, um, one standard currency that, in a sense, is always going to have a certain inherent value to it is gold, whether it's in the form of a coin, bars, or whatever, if you dug it out of the ground in the form of nuggets, you know, and um, they checked it out, figured out its purity and everything. Gold, 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 gold. Now, from the oldest times in the Bible, like if we're reading the account of Abraham starting in Genesis 12, we can see that he used gold and others used gold with him. Because um, no matter what society he was trading with, whether he spoke their language or not, or whether they had the same kind of economic uh, trade values or not particularly, gold was a universal. It was a universal standard that would trade from uh, city to city, society to society, country to country, empire to empire. And it is still the same to this day. So what one must wonder then is if these people who call themselves Jews, and we can go back to the really old, old, old world ones, I mean older than, than Fugger, and far more powerful and far more secretive than Fugger. You know, the ones that would be associated with those old world names like Furnace and, and Medici, you know. Um, so they're lending to kings and nobles and people, and they go from countries to countries, and they have a network set up all over the world. All over the world from the earliest days. Now listen. You know, you guys, a lot of you can disagree with me on my opinion of the Americas, specifically North America, 
as being the setting for where the Bible actually took place. Go ahead and disagree with me if you want, it's fine. But there's no way that worldwide trading has been going on from the earliest times and everybody just kept missing America? Are you out of your mind? Are you insane? I mean, anybody who believes that just hasn't sat down and thought it through for five or ten minutes. Five or ten minutes. The seas were never a disadvantage to peoples, to traders throughout all time. The seas are an advantage. The seas are a highway. I mean, gosh, it's even said, I believe it's by Rosenberg who says it, I'm not sure. Might have been another author I've been reading. Um, who even said that the Jews preferred the seas because if they traveled on sea, then they had an excuse to be traveling on their Sabbath because they can't do anything about gaining ground on water. The sea is never a disadvantage to anybody. So, we already know that uncounted tons, uncounted tons of very specific, of a very specific type of copper came from uh, the islands of Lake Michigan. Tons, so many tons that it would have taken so many stinking years to mine this stuff and to move this stuff um, that it's just insane how long people would have had to have been here using sophisticated means and methods to remove all that. We know that a great deal of gold comes from the Americas, South America and North America. And if we did the same thing with that gold as has been done when it can be done, because I, I think that certain very powerful people don't want a lot of this done, you can track the gold by its properties to where it was most likely mined from. And if gold has been, from the time of Abraham, a universal means of trade, then, of course, that's also something that remained a universal mean of, means of trade before they set up the essentially a worldwide um, network of notes and it doesn't look like they set up a very successful uh, worldwide if you want to call it that network of uh, banknotes for gold until the time of the people called Rothschild um, until then, the problem was they, they still had constant problems in constant countries because, well, because they parasite off the people. They weren't getting as much problem from nobles, like from time to time they'd get a decent noble that would come to the throne like Henry I, um, who ejected them from England. Uh, and a lot of times these kings and nobles had selfish reasons for doing what they did too. You know, you look at like King Henry VIII, he, his, his motives for um, abandoning the Catholic Church and setting up the Anglican Church were absolutely the most selfish motives possible. There was, there was nothing pure and true about that. Anybody who tries to sell you that that was some kind of pure uh, move uh, on his part is full of it. Uh, King Henry VIII was utterly Catholic in his thinking, his actions and everything. But so... A lot of reasons that, that, that these kings, nobles, powers at the time would have ejected Jews might have been very selfish. Um, but it often happened. And what typically would happen is there would be an uprising of the people that got tired of being exploited and used. They got tired of, uh, and this one's a big one, they would get, if they started finding their children or their young people dead, uh, which they would oftentimes upon investigation find out that it was ritualistic oftentimes drained of their blood you can find a few works on that that are still in existence out there that you can still get that would cause a popular uprising that's why many Jews lived in places called ghettos 
but they weren't like the ghettos on good times. They were walled cities. Um, they were gated communities. They were very well protected and defended where, wherever they went. You see, our whole perception that has been sold to us about their persecutions, utter nonsense. Um, but anyways, so where was all the gold coming from for all of these loans to all of these nobles and all of the usurious loans to all of the peoples in the various places they went? Because gold... Gold is one thing that's going to be universal, as is silver. A lot of silver comes from the Americas. I mean, I've seen the maps. I've seen the maps in Spanish, usually. Sometimes uh, in early French. Showing cities. Uh, oftentimes... Uh, the icons will look maybe like a little castle or something, but um, from the 1400s. Um, and not from the time of Columbus before that. And even if it was from the time of Columbus, we're talking about cities and places named in North and South America already known of. Come on, folks. Come on, folks. People have been sailing the world from the earliest times. Nobody missed America. But for some crazy reason, America, the Americas, North and South, are this gigantic black hole in history, in geography, in the sciences and disciplines. I would imagine only a people that had a sophisticated worldwide network that wanted to hide a place from as many people as possible could perhaps affect such a thing and could pull off the kind of international intrigue that it would take over a long period of time to essentially get the, the market share on a place. Because there's just no other way to explain why there's the black hole of the Americas in history. None. And so I'm going to end it there. I'm in I'm almost an hour and a half now. Uh, I said it was going to be sporadic, so I didn't let you down. Um, and and I'm, I'm really hoping I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see you guys again very soon with uh, my next edition of the series. Uh, that is the one series uh, besides for when I, whenever I have somebody on for a live interview, which actually the next one will be the week after the last Sunday of this month because I'm getting the uh, my last infusions of chemo uh, this week. So on the last Sunday of this month, month, which I believe will be the 26th or 7th, um, I will still be very sick from that last infusion. So it's uh, it's going to be... Uh, Obi from the uh, um, the Christian Identity Forum. He's going to be coming on, but it's going to be a week past that Sunday, so it's actually going to be the first Sunday um, in June. Um, and I will post that up at least a week beforehand so that everybody knows and they, they see it coming. So besides those, yeah, the Mormonism is Judaism is the only one I'm putting out as a podcast right now. And I had to do so much research on that, that there was such a huge window and then the, the sicknesses that were caused from chemo and all that stuff. Um, that will be out very soon. Uh, I have to change some of the narrations on Euphrates, a problem with geography, because of a lot of the work I've been doing in, in Koine uh, recently. 
uh, and hopefully I can put that out soon. I wish I had somebody that actually wanted to do the video end. So then I could just do, you know, the writing of the articles, uh, I could do the narration uh, off of the articles, and then somebody could basically just put together the slideshow uh, over the narrative. And I mean, it's, you know, basically when I do a slideshow over a narrative, I, I just record the narrative, I listen to the narrative, uh, and, and essentially get photos and things like that, and then create a slideshow. And I do it in, um, uh, what is it, it's the Windows, it's <laughs> Windows Movie Maker. Uh, because right now I don't have enough RAM to use some of the, the nicer programs that are out there. So that's what I work with, you know, just basically doing a slideshow. Um, but yeah, so it's going to be a little bit of time on that before you're going to see anything. But you can still go to uh, obreproject.info and, and read the paper, Euphrates, A Problem with Geography. It's I think it's only a 15-page paper. It's not that huge. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's chocked full of obri. But not so much that you can't just have that open as a PDF and have the Obrey pronunciation, which is only a few pages long, open and 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 know basically how to pronounce this. There's so many Obrey letters that look just like English letters. It it, it doesn't take much time. Uh, and, and the only problem is I I could have used English, I could have used transliterated English, but uh, I just think that's going to keep us back in the dark. You know, so it, it is a challenge, um, but it's not that big of a challenge, you know, and, and challenge yourself. That's the only way you're going to grow. I accidentally hit pause. <laughs> uh, anyways, so there, there's all that. And of course, you know, I'm chomping at the bit to finish uh, the, the readings on history, fiction or science and all that. Cause it's so much to do and so little time. So speaking of, uh, I'll see you all next time.